Hafadeh, and welcome to our very special program we're calling The Interview. We sat down with each of this year's gubernatorial candidates, the incumbent Democrat Lou Leon Guerrero, and her challenger, former Republican Governor Felix Camacho. We also spoke briefly with their respective running mates, Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio for the Democrats and Senator Tony Adda for the Republicans. We focused our questions on the issues we believe are important to you and that you want to hear from them about. First, you'll hear from the Democratic team of Lou and Josh, followed by the Republicans, Camacho Adda. Thank you and welcome to the interview. All right, Governor, of course, your first term has been uh, dominated by this unprecedented uh, pandemic um, global. Uh, mm -hmm. How would you grade how you've handled it and why? I think I handled it, I, I handled it uh, very well. Uh, you know, in the beginning, of course, no one knew exactly what this virus was about. Science wasn't, I think, prepared to deal with it. Uh, but you know, Nestor, when I um, heard about it, of course, my whole um, experience in nursing and healthcare uh, gave me a lot of confidence. And I knew that if we didn't act uh, urgently and aggressively, that we would stand to uh, be in a worse situation. And so, um, in any kind of infectious diseases, the main concern is to minimize exposure and minimize, minimize transmission. And that's exactly what we did with uh, quarantining, asking people to stay home, uh, closing off uh, non-essential government businesses, masking, watching your distance, hand washing, all of that very basic uh, public health preventive measures. And as a result of that, once uh, vaccinations came in, uh, I was much more relieved and less stressed because I knew that then vaccination would uh, be the main safeguard for our island community. It was hard decisions to make. I knew I got a lot of criticisms about my uh, strategic approach and very logical and methodical approach, but it was basically um, driven by science and data. And Throughout the whole pandemic, I was in great communication with experts, CDC, HHS, and of course, the White House with their also strategic um, uh, at attack and approach to it. So uh, yes, it was a great time of uncertainty and fear and anxiety, but I uh, really believe I handled it very well. I got a good team team of experts and I just want to thank the people of Guam too because uh, without their cooperation and of course without their um, participation and helping each other and helping ourselves we wouldn't be where we are today where we are now back to some normalcy of our lives. Yeah. Aside from the pandemic um, is there anything that you learned in this year first term that you could carry over and would benefit you in your second term if you are reelected? Sure, I think uh, better communication maybe with uh, the public, uh, more uh, messaging out there, more bringing the public along with the processes that we're doing. Uh, although I really believe that during the pandemic and my first few years of our administration, we have been very transparent and very accountable uh, to the people of Guam. I think uh, what, what we need to do is, again, work and strengthen uh, relationships with each other, uh, internet, uh, interconnect with agencies, and also working with the community and the private sector, of course. Involve all of Guam. And uh, I think everyone, all leaders, need to take uh, more attention to that and, and do more of that for our people. Governor, um, we have a severe drug problem on this mm -hmm. island dating back to the 1990s. ICE was the drug of choice even back then. Um, how would you go about finding a lasting solution? Because it's destroying lives, it's destroyed lives. What is the lasting solution to this drug crisis? I think we have to look at uh, how we approach the drug problem. And I think uh, we need to approach it in a very uh, comprehensive manner. We need to look at it as a health uh, situation, uh, a health epidemic, and we need to pay attention to prevention, 
to treatment, to law enforcement, to rehabilitation. You know, we have to, it's a very complex issue. I think the lasting effect would, for me would be uh, a greater uh, comprehensive approach to it. Uh, and we've done that. We have worked very closely with schools. We have worked with the police officers. We work very closely with our behavioral health and wellness center where we are providing um, community outreach, where we are providing preventive measures, where we are also treating patients there. Uh, we've stood up the first detox unit in our Behavioral Health and Wellness Center, which is very important to support the person who's going through withdrawals. We also are heavily investing in community community outreach and rehabilitation. We're also working very closely with nonprofit organizations because we understand that as a government, we can't do it by ourselves. We need to include nonprofit, faith-based, our schools, our, our religious leaders, our uh, legislative leaders, uh, and ev even the courts. So it has to be a comprehensive approach. We can't just say, oh, it has to be law enforcement. We want to decrease the supply, we want to decrease the demand, and we want to treat that individual and the family in a very holistic, comprehensive uh, approach. All right, we have to take a short break, but we'll be back with our discussion with Democratic gubernatorial candidate, Governor Leon, Leon Guerrero, right after this. The Camacho Ada campaign asks all our supporters to vote on the Republican side of the ballot on election day. From our friends Felix Camacho and Tony Ada for governor and lieutenant governor, Jim Moylan for delegate to the U.S. Congress, and our 15 candidates for the Guam legislature. Vote Republican from the top to the bottom. It all begins with you. You have to get involved with the process. That's how elections are won. I'm Felix Camacho. And I'm Tony Atta. And we approve this message. Hello, half a day. My name is Dwayne Snickless. Most of you know me as Mr. Goodman. I am asking for your support to serve you in the 37th Guam Legislature. Mabuhay! Ako po si Elina Shatin San Nicolas. Suportahan niyo po ang aking asawa na si Dwayne San Nicolas para senador. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. This is Dwayne San Nicolas and I approve this message. Welcome back. Uh, Governor, before the break, we were talking about um, drugs as, as uh, you know, a severe problem here. Sure. What about the broader issue of crime, in particular uh, violent crime? How are we uh, going to address that? Yes. <clears throat> you know, we've seen that most of the crime is as a result of drugs. Uh, methamphetamine, as I said, is one of the worst drugs uh, in, in, as an outcome for our people. And so in our administration, we made the decision on uh, making sure that we are recruiting and retaining our police officers. As you know, there's competition out there for law enforcement, and we wanted to make sure that the Guam Police Department, which is the premier law enforcement unit, uh, is given the resources, not just human resources, but also equipment, vehicles, uh, all those necessary tools that they need to do their job. And that is why we raised the salaries also of our police officers. Um, and as a result of that, we're seeing retention. As a result of that, we're seeing more recruitment. We've also did a creative thing where we um, asked the retirees to come back and to help out with the police department and how they're helping is of course they're taking uh, responsibility for the desk work, the administrative work, so we can push our law enforcement back out into the community. We also have a great uh, neighborhood watch program that uh, I and the chief of police went around the villages and we talked to people. There are some villages whose neighborhood watch program is uh, more sophisticated than others, but there's that great movement to expand it, improve it, and grow it more. And that has helped. Uh, 
I am getting a positive uh, response from the Neighborhood Watch. They're saying now that police officers are coming uh, more on time. They're there. So hopefully with these kinds of measures that we can uh, deter crime in addition to, again, like we discussed, working to decrease the demand and the supply for uh, drugs. Governor, the pandemic has exposed how vulnerable our economy is. Um, there was a global standstill virtually in tourism and we are heavily reliant, of course, on the visitor industry. So be specific and explain how we, we can diversify our economy. Sure. Um, when uh, the pandemic came and I saw that, you know, our mainstay economy, tourism, was really at zero. Uh, I, that I worked hard to uh, stand up a economic diversification task force uh, and representatives from the chamber, from private sectors, from public sectors are members of this task force. And I looked at what is uh, realistic industries that we can invite to come here. One of the things I worked uh, really hard together with the lieutenant governor is uh, the industry of 3D manufacturing. Um, that industry is going to be very beneficial for us, not just uh, for our people in the civilian part, but also in the military part. And as you know, 3D manufacturing, 3D printing uh, can produce uh, supplies uh, necessary, say, to repair the ships in the ship repair yards. And as a result of that, uh, it'd be more effective and more efficient in repairing the ships so they can go back out. Um, if we bring that here, we would have jobs created and we would even more so decrease maybe the cost of supplies for our community. It's very feasible, very realistic. Um, we are bringing, uh, bringing on board a company go called Astro, and they're doing a feasibility study here. They're one of the biggest companies in 3D manufacturing. They have contracts with the military, and uh, they saw the need for that when we were making those discussions and making those inroads. And uh, certainly, to me, I'm really excited. Of course, the other part is telecommunications, data warehousing. We have uh, about 11 uh, cables running through our island. We have a lot of uh, help financially in the infrastructure bill for um, uh, broadband. And so we want to push that out as much as we can. And as a result of that, create jobs in data, in telecommunication. Very, very feasible. Agriculture is another one. Uh, aquaculture is another one. These are uh, industries that are can be uh, very profitable to our island, provide the tax revenues that we need to push out for better public service for our people. So I'm excited with those kinds of very real, very practical practical and will be coming to our island. In, in about a minute, can you uh, address um, the high cost of living? Uh, U.S. economists say we're facing a possible, a probable recession. Yes. Um, and it's uh, driving a lot of people away from the island in search of a better uh, uh, place to, to, yeah. to provide for their family. Yeah, you know, Nestor Guam has always been a place of high cost of living because we import uh, 80% of our goods and, and products to Guam, right? So we are at the mercy of the cost of goods. We are at the mercy of the supply chain. Uh, and of course, the pandemic has impacted that. Um, you're right, the U.S. nationally is trying to decrease uh, inflation and to help out with the cost of living by, you know, doing uh, monetary policies through the Federal Reserve, um, the Federal Reserve Board as a way to slow down uh, inflation and uh, make it much more reasonable for cost of living. Here locally, what we have done is we have looked at what a family's expenses are. And we wanted to at least help in those areas so that they can better, uh, I guess, address the cost of living. Cost of living, as you know, is mainly in food and in fuel. And so of course, we're pushing out renewable energy to help with the fuel part, the energy part. Uh, but more so, we are also looking at 
how can we relieve some of the expenses of our people? Child care is one of the biggest expenses that people are facing. And so we are pushing out, of course, our grants. And by the way, these are annual grants. These are ongoing, uh, stable, sustainable grants that we're pushing out to child care. And we're seeing good results because I was just looking at some data and we are seeing more women now going back to work. And as a result, we're seeing decrease in unemployment. Um, and, and it is really helping our uh, families' finances. That's a cost of about $675 a month for childcare. And if you have two kids going, that's $1,350 of savings in expenses. So now the family can have more cash flow to help out with their daily uh, needs and daily challenges of life. All right, we're gonna take another break and we'll be right back, don't go away. In the next 10 years, I'll be able to make my own choices for leadership. But until then, we're counting on you to choose leaders who want everyone who calls Guam home to have a voice. I need you to choose a well-rounded leader with real-world experiences. If I could vote, I would vote for James Moylan, a soldier, a law enforcer, a lawmaker, a fighter. This election, vote for me and the next generation of Guam leaders by voting for James Moylan for Congress. And we're back. Uh, Governor, one of the other issues that has really um, been um, up front a lot is the, the homeless. It's very visible. We see new people uh, on the street corners uh, panhandling uh, every week. There's also the land for the landless, uh, the Chamorro Land Trust and lack of development, uh, housing costs on the rise. How do you address um, this, this uh, overall homelessness and housing cost situation? Well, with homelessness, Nestor, what we have done for the first time in decades uh, in our administration is we have purchased a shelter for our homeless, uh, for our homeless people. And what we have done is we have um, asked them to come to these shelters, and most of them do. There are some that will not come. And uh, the ones that do come, we not only just house them, but we also give them uh, resources to either get back to work, to find a more permanent housing. So we're working with all the agencies that uh, are available to provide the housing for them. Uh, in the area of affordable housing, I guess you're, you're looking at, that is a concern, of course, uh, for our people. And uh, what we have done is we've provided aids and assistance for first-time homeowners to help them with their closing cost. We have also uh, taken a lot of our abandoned homes and uh, re we are reno renovating them, repairing them, so we can push them back out for affordable housing. We work very closely with the uh, GURA, of course, and of course with the LIHTC development program uh, that's going to be providing uh, affordable homes. We're working with that. For the first time, we are also using QC for, uh, to entice uh, development uh, to come to provide affordable homes. In the area of land for the landless, of course, CLTC, our Ch uh, Chamorro Land Trust, we are uh, getting um, infrastructure money. And what we want to do is push out the infrastructure development for those Chamorro Land Trusts. We have also identified land that we can um, use to provide development in there. So if you have your QC to help with the developers, you have the land to provide, then all this is gonna work towards having a development using Ch uh, Chamorro Land Trust to provide more affordable homes to our people. All right, uh, Governor, I don't think it, there's anyone that disputes the need for a new hospital. Uh, GMH is nearing, if, if it's not already at, it's, uh, you know, uh, his end point. Mm -hmm. um, you have selected a 
piece of property uh, in Mangilao. You have come under criticism for that, and you've also come under criticism for holding on to about $300 million um, for the eventual construction of a new uh, medical campus. Can you respond to that? Sure. You know, the identification of the Eagles Field was after, uh, after uh, surveys, and uh, we, uh, the uh, contracted uh, agency that went out there to assess, we assessed 15 sites. And of the 15 sites, Eagle Field was the much more um, positive. You know, it's flat, it's near a, a major thoroughfare, it has infrastructure capabilities that wouldn't be so costly. And with the willingness of the military to lease 102 acres of uh, land space for a medical center complex, it just all aligned. I am, I am very sensitive to the homeowners uh, of Eaglesville. I've been meeting with the homeowners. Uh, that piece of property, Nestor, was very clear that if uh, we do not use it as a uh, hospital or a, a medical center, the military will keep it. So it's not excess land to be returned to the landowners. Uh, subsequently, I am very concerned about our home, our uh, landowners getting really fair and just compensation. We just introduced a bill uh, that would reform the land, uh, the land uh, bank uh, act. It's called, and what we're trying to do is. Um, make sure that the law is uh, amended to a point where we can uh, have eligibility requirements, uh, we can have identify a source of funding. There, there was not a source of funding, but now we can identify a real life uh, stream of funding and how we calculate and distribute it out to our people. We deserve a really good state of the heart art hospital, a hospital that can provide the services for our people. And uh, Eaglesville remains to be the better choice uh, in that section. Uh, we do not have uh, $300 million just hanging on or $300 million just uh, floating around. That whole $300 million is identified uh, for uh, transformation for sustaining of our services till 2024, 2026. It is also the responsible thing to take some of that money and invest it into our hospital. So I have put aside about $160 million so that when we are ready with the lease and all that, I can have immediate funds to start the preparatory work, to put in the infrastructure, to start and groundbreak uh, our hospital and our medical uh, center. So um, all that was taken into consideration. Plan for now, what is the short term that we need to do, and then what do we need to do in the future to provide our people with an ongoing sustainable uh, facility for our health care. All right, Governor, and finally, um, we've got about a minute or so left. Um, I want you to look into that camera and um, tell the people of Guam why they should vote for you. Thank you very much, Nestor. I am asking the people of Guam to please vote for Lou and Josh for four more years. We have a lot of projects and programs that we want to provide to better service our people, to lift up the quality of life. Uh, if you look at our record and our performance, you will see that we are the better team. Our performance is this. We have financially stabilized our government. We are paying tax returns in two weeks. We have retired and inherited 83 million deficit and we are now have the we are now have the fortunate uh, situation of having a surplus so we can take that money, push it back out to our people for better service in health, education, safety and infrastructure. So please on November 8th and early voting, please vote for Josh and I. Thank you and Sidus Masi. Thank you, Governor. Uh, it's time for another break and we'll be back with Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio right after this. Tony and I are on a mission to stop the importation of drugs, to treat drug addicts, 
to hire more police officers and train them to combat the increase in violent crimes, to revive this economy and make tourism viable again, to fix the hospital, including the maternity ward. Tony and I will work from the very beginning of our term and not wait until the end. That's the Camacho at a difference. I'm Felix Camacho and I approve this message. So you're registered to vote? Well, what's next? Find your precinct on gec.guam.gov. And if you don't want to wait till election day, remember the early voting center at the Westin Resort begins on Tuesday, October 11th, and they're open from Tuesday through Friday up until Thursday, November 3rd. You can also check out these other satellite voting districts on Saturdays. Ready, set, vote. And we're back and we're joined with the uh, Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio, who is also the Democratic uh, candidate for Lieutenant Governor. Thanks for joining us, Thank LT. you. Thank you. I just got a couple of questions for you. First of all, um, what will you, uh, if you guys are successful, what do you envision will be your role next term? Will there be any difference or will you expand it? I think that um, I was able to carve out, uh, at least in this first term, and what I would uh, uh, expect we would continue is a pretty good partnership with the governor where I've been able to really address and formulate uh, a lot of executive branch policy. And of course, she has relied on uh, me to kind of guide us through uh, with infrastructure. I've been uh, working a lot in doing some major long-term improvements and reforms to um, building permit, um, the system, the procedures and all that stuff, uh, but really trying to push infrastructure projects out to the community. Um, I'll continue, of course, uh, uh, to work on beautification, beautification. I've been, um, I, in at least the chart, uh, the path that I uh, carved out for this has been to uh, do very public meetings. Uh, you know, I stream the meetings on Facebook, but uh, I hit on a lot of the topics that people are looking for progress on. So everything from the abandoned vehicles to abandoned animals to road projects, parks, uh, trying to uh, look all those community things that people are looking forward to and of course been uh, working a lot on homelessness, uh, drug treatment, things like that, youth programs. I would expect to continue on that. Again, if you're successful, um, what will be your top priorities in your first 100 days as Lieutenant Governor? I know typically in a second term you try to finish off all of the things, the priorities and the programs that you first uh, established in your initial term? Sure. Uh, for me, um, I've been pushing a whole bunch of projects. So the first 100 days, I expect to um, be already um, initiating the change into the online uh, building permit system. Uh, that means that we'll be deploying um, software training personnel and the public. Uh, I will be opening uh, transitional homes and shelter. Uh, that will be used to uh, decompress some of the emergency shelters that we support with the nonprofit uh, organizations and the communities. Uh, I expect to be um, uh, exp opening some additional uh, inpatient beds for drug treatment um, in partnership with Salvation Army and uh, uh, public facilities that we'll make available for um, the nonprofits to utilize. And I expect to uh, be uh, really involved in pushing along the Simon Sanchez construction project. If you and the governor are successful, uh, do you have any um, political aspirations beyond 2026? I, have, I am. I do have some aspirations. Uh, but, you know, just trying to see what the pulse of the people is and making sure that I can provide them the leadership and the experience that they need uh, to push the island forward. And so I'd say my options are pretty much open, but I definitely uh, have op uh, aspirations. All right. Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio, the Democratic candidate for Lieutenant Governor. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. We'll be back with more right after this. Hello, how are you? Wow, see Dwayne Sir Nicholas. Tao Tao Hagetu. See Tatao, see Hossein Sir Nicholas, Commissioner in Hagat. That's in now, Lourdes Diaz Sir Nicholas, Master in JP Taurus. Hugagagao Hamzu, me supporting me to Parabai who set me Hamzu, give me that Trentai Shetty and Lehes Laturan Guahun. 
para imenaule ki famagonta, zan imanae nata, zan todu ni man mamela na tempo. Si zuus maasi. This is Dwayne St. Nicholas, and I approve this message. Judy Wampat's voting record for Guam shows she will vote for herself. As Speaker of the Guam Legislature, she gave herself a $30,000 pay raise and a $15,000 retro payment. For that, Guam voted her out of office. She claims she's a fighter. If she's elected into Congress, she will fight the United States government and Guam will lose billions of dollars in opportunities. Vote James Moylan for Congress. Jim's a real fighter for Guam and not for himself. I'm James Moylan and I approve this message. Governor, it's uh, been 12 years since you last um, were in political office, a two-term governor. Mm -hmm. Why are you running? I felt a calling. I've, I felt that um, things have gotten quite desperate on the island, and I'm concerned about the generation that follows my, my, my children, my grandchildren, and, and the direction that we have been heading. So I, I felt that I'm not going to sit on the sidelines anymore. I'm not going to um, just sit this one out. I, I felt that it was time to, to answer a call. Of course, it's something that I really had to pray on and, um, and bring to the family and discuss it with those. And, and then I had to make a decision that I, I, couldn't, I didn't want to go on with my life thinking that I had the opportunity to make a difference. I had an opportunity to step up and offer myself in the area of leadership in, in the area that I've been, uh, having served as governor with experience to, to not take that step. And I, I didn't want to live a life of regret looking back saying, what if I could have made a difference? What if I, I did step up and, and, and serve again? And so with that, I, I just felt it was a, an act of obedience to what I felt the Lord was calling me to do. And here I am running with Tony Atta. Governor, we, we have a drug problem. I think there's no yeah. uh, disputing that. Mm -hmm. um, crystal methamphetamine, uh, known as ICE. Mm -hmm. um, we've had it since the 1990s. I can remember reporting on it, and it doesn't seem to have been, gotten any better. Yes. Um, it has destroyed lives. Mm -hmm. It's destroying lives. Uh, what would you do as governor to attack this uh, drug crisis that we're uh, suffering from? This is going to require an all-out effort it, it, it really is a state of emergency. One of the first things I'm going to do would be to step in and declare, uh, declare a state of emergency for, for public safety, especially with re re regards to the drug ep epidemic. We are in a war, and it's going to be a war against drugs, and I'm going to get very serious about it. I, um, I think that the current administration has, um, has failed in this effort. And uh, I know that with the experience that I've had working with Guam Police Department uh, before and all the, all the regulatory and, and public safety agencies in Guam, uh, the regional um, relationships that I have, the federal relationships that I can build up again, we're going to be able to, to get the resources we need. We're going to get the cooperation that we need. And, uh, and we're going to muster up all the effort that's necessary to take this on because lives are being destroyed Every family has been affected by this. And although there are those that are, find it lucrative, it's at the expense of, of the lives of our, our youth. And people from all walks of life have been affected. So I am going to put all the resources necessary, not only local, but uh, also federal, and, and take a regional approach in addressing this thing. Along those lines, uh, the broader issue of crime in general, mm -hmm. um, is there a need for more police, uh, for more corrections officers, for more prison space, for a stronger prosecution? What is your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's not just the executive branch and public safety, but you've also got the attorney general's office that's very much involved in that. We've got the U.S. District and federal court that's absolutely necessary. And when it comes to police officers, as you mentioned, uh, there are two to 300 short right now. I want to, as part of that, declaration of a state of emergency is to get out there and make an all-out effort to recruit. Even if we have to provide signing bonuses, 
work with Department of Administration in, in speeding up the hiring process. Right now, I, I believe our police officers have been overworked. They're stressed, they're working long hours, and they're undermanned. And so we have to fill that void. Working again with the Attorney General's office and, and uh, also the federal court, uh, we have to take a comprehensive approach and, and really lay out what are the problems. We can't continue with the old system that this is how things have always been done and this is how we're going to continue to do it. There has to be uh, a transition into something effective and, and, and more robust in the area of prosecution. And then, of course, we have our prisons. Uh, we, we are going to look at the process and, and the system that has been established. Of course, you're looking at the physical, the facility. It, it is uh, overcrowded. We have to take a look at, and, and talk with the regional leaders within the freely associated states and others where uh, the population of uh, FAS compared to our local population within the prison is just about even right now. And there's a real power struggle. There's a turf battle going on in there for control of the prison and all the illicit activity that goes on. That has to, we have to do a crackdown. But in working with our regional leaders, like I did when we established the Micronesian chiefs, get back to understand, all right, uh, what do we do to, to work? I know Governor Eddy had extradited or, or sent um, others after they, they met certain criteria to send them back to, to their respective islands. We, we have to maybe take a look at that also, but uh, do it in a more comprehensive and cooperative manner with the freely associated states in the Compact of Free Association and see what we can do. We need to work with um, faith-based organizations and uh, prison ministry and find out how can we, how can we uh, lower the recidivism as they leave, they come back, they, they continue to cycle through. And when you look at the homelessness situation, that's part of it also. They get out, and the way laws of our society and, and uh, our island have been established is that uh, they can't get a job because of their criminal record. And uh, which of these individuals uh, can get a pardon? Which of them can, can get their, their record exonerated or, or cleared to the point where they can um, get their paperwork together, they can get a second chance at life and, and then succeed. So I, I really want to uh, um, work hard in establishing the fact that these individuals have a, a second chance. I also want to see what we can do with using that pent up energy that we have within the prisons and again through, through a program to get them out there working in our community, whether it be maintaining our roadways, whether it be other, doing other things for the community under proper guidance and protection that we can utilize this manpower out there. And, uh, and also allow for, for every hour they work, that's an hour d deducted from their time in, uh, of sentence. So many creative ideas we're going to implement, looking at other jurisdictions and what they have done to bring about the change necessary and change lives. Um, and then, of course, the challenge of finding a, a proper facility for them. I, I don't think the solution is always going to be to big, build bigger prisons. Uh, there, there is a problem within our society that's causing our men and women to, to um, a life of crime. And, uh, and, and that's why in our, in our, our platform we talk about the seven pillars. Um, and certainly family and, and faith are, are, are two of those that we, we need to... We need to do that because many, many of families have been broken and uh, young men and women are out there without any guidance. And so it's not just the role of government, but what role can each of our people play um, in the responsibility they have over their children and raising them up with proper guidance yeah. and let, discipline? Let me interrupt you right there. Uh, We've got to take a quick break and we'll be back yeah. with more of our conversation with Re Republican gubernatorial candidate, former Governor Felix Camacho, right after this. The Camacho Ada approach to reviving Guam's economy stands on our seven pillars of opportunity. Business development is central to our platform. Tony and I are both businessmen who know the role that government should play in encouraging and supporting economic growth. For more information on how we will help our economy rebuild and prosper, please visit CamachoAdaForGuam.com. Taking care of business and opportunity, this will be a new season. I'm Felix Camacho. I'm Tony Ada. We, we approve, approve this message. 
So you're registered to vote? Well, what's next? Find your precinct on gec.guam.gov. And if you don't want to wait till election day, remember the early voting center at the Westin Resort begins on Tuesday, October 11th, and they're open from Tuesday through Friday up until Thursday, November 3rd. You can also check out these other satellite voting districts on Saturdays. Ready, set, vote. Welcome back, and we're continuing our conversation with the Republican gubernatorial candidate, uh, former Governor Felix Camacho. Governor, um, one of the things that the pandemic has kind of exposed is how, mm -hmm. just how uh, vulnerable our economy is. Um, we have relied for so many years on just two pillars, uh, tourism, of course, mm -hmm. and military federal spending. Mm -hmm. uh, and this has been going on for so many years. You hear the politicians say the need for diversity mm -hmm. still hasn't happened. What is your plan to diversify our economy? It, it, it is true that um, with, an, with an island that has no export, the one thing that we've been able to do is export our best and our brightest um, of our youth that would pursue other careers, even those that would join the uh, active duty of the Department of Defense in, in, in the military, um, and many never to return. So we, we really do need to find ways of um, retaining the best and brightest on, on island with, with opportunity. And where does opportunity come from? Careers and, and jobs. Uh, there's no question that the military buildup is, is going, as was explained by the Admiral, another 1.2 to 2 billion or, uh, or so, I mean million a year, you know, for the next 10 years. Uh, rather, it, the, the, the numbers are, are quite la large and so, for what, with 1.2 to 2 billion a year uh, expenditure there, the number of jobs that are going to be created and the careers available are tremendous. Uh, I have two of my, my daughters that are currently federal civil service. Uh, they found uh, um, amazing careers and one of them is even with the National Guard. But um, when you look at private sector, yes, the pandemic has certainly, the governor has shut down Many businesses, uh, people have gone and remained unemployed because they found it to be more lucrative to stay home and, and collect uh, federal dollars. And in talking to those in the private sector, there's going to be a real need to actually even retrain uh, people to get back into the workforce. The, uh, the many attempts to get, to get the new employees to come back in, even those that, that had served before, has been quite difficult uh, in the restaurant business, in the hotel and hospitality industry. And so when we think about how do, I, how do we do diversify this economy, I, I believe if we look into the areas of technology, there are many geopolitical events happening around uh, this part of the world with the aggressiveness of China uh, upon Taiwan. And we look at North Korea, and their aggressiveness also with um, against, uh, you've got neighboring South Korea, you have Japan, uh, we have the Philippines next, next door. And so what can we bring uh, from these regions that makes sense for Guam? The attraction for Guam is the fact that we are a U.S. territory, that we, have, uh, we are governed by U.S. law and, uh, and the protection of, of investments into here. So uh, as I've done in the past, it would be to go out again and, and begin to talk to specific industries that we could perhaps bring in. Uh, when we talk about the cost of shipping, for example, all the costs are front loaded. It is very expensive to bring uh, a ship load of containers to Guam for produce and for whatever we, our consumers need on island. Um, and so the costs are front loaded. Many of the shippers say if, if you could find an industry and develop something that would be exportable out of Guam, some of that cost can be transferred on, on, um, on the takeout uh, as they exit Guam. Instead of empty containers, perhaps they can fill it with other, other produce. What can we do here locally within the region, just within the Marianas, within the freely associated states? But the, the key would be we're, we're moving into an area of technology now. And with that, um, there could be opportunities where you would have final assembly of certain items or products 
for, uh, and it could have the label made in Guam, you know, or made in the USA, similar to what they had before in the CNMI with the garment industry. We've had uh, on Guam even ma watch manufacturing to some extent. We had garment, and we had a, a, maybe a couple of other ventures, only to be shut down by other lobbyists uh, from U.S. Congress. So there are going to be opportunities that we will explore, but I believe the, the opportunities will be in the area of, te of technology. Yeah. On a similar note, yeah. um, the high cost of living is driving a lot of our people away. Yeah. Um, young couples in particular are looking uh, for places where um, they are paid a higher salary, where they can better mm -hmm. uh, provide for their families. Um, Mainland economists are saying we are facing a likely recession. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are successful, it would probably occur in your first year in office. Mm -hmm. um, what is your strategy to address this, what uh, apparently will be looming recession and uh, financial difficulties for the island? What's happening is it, it is not only on Guam and, and the United States. We are already in a, in a recession. And um, if you look at what's happening with all the different wars, uh, you talk about Russia, Ukraine. Uh, we talk about the aggressiveness that's happening. There, there are wars right now in Ethiopia. Uh, it's a hidden war. There's a lot going on. And, and more and more geopolitical um, and military type conflict that will occur. So I think the world globally is going to go through some uh, terrible times. But, you know, what happens is when you hit bottom, there's not, nowhere else to go back up. And, um, and so we have to, I think we're going to have to go into an area of um, not only being mindful of the expenses of the government, although a, a billion dollar budget has been presented to the governor uh, and by the legislature in, in the most recent um, budget act, uh, I recall when I came in, it was down at uh, roughly 320 some odd million dollars, and so it's grown significantly, you know, by close to 700 million over over the last 12 years. Um, so there's going to ha there's going to ha have to be austerity measures, but at the same time, we we need to find ways to address the cost of our fuel, and and we all know that that's what's been driving up the cost of uh, even transportation. To bring in a 40-foot uh, container in the Guam is close to $10,000. Um, the cost of a gallon of milk has gone up uh, tremendously, if you will. And so we have to begin to prepare for an area of, uh, or a time of, of uh, uh, some suffering. We believe that's happening globally. But uh, by, by being prudent in, in the expenditures of the government, by working closely with the private sector, by bringing in other... Uh, Again, other ventures that, that can bring prosperity to the island. You see, I think what, what right now we're faced with um, after three and a half years of, of uh, uh, or, you know, COVID-19 and, and the after effects of the executive orders that the governor has placed on, on this island to shut everything down, um, we've been in a comatose state. Um, businesses have been killed. Careers have been killed. Dreams have been killed. And, um, and that's why people have left. They, they saw no hope, but Tony and I intend to restore hope. We believe that it is going to be a season of hope. It is going to be a season of prosperity. It is going to be a season of growth. But all that happens. Uh, they talk about the Phoenix rising. Well, you know, from ashes, we're going to have to come back up because uh, Lewis ab absolutely decimated our economy. What took 50 years to develop, she has crushed in three years. And, and so uh, we're going to have to work together. And, and as I mentioned, by going out, uh, out, out of our borders and bringing in investors and looking at other areas of investment, we're going to revive this economy. We're going to have to restore um, lives that have been here. So yes, there are going to be challenges, uh, whether it's uh, me or, or anyone else who's, who uh, sits in that table or behind that desk. There are going to be challenges, but with the experience that I bring, uh, I've, I've been there in, in the worst of times, and I'll be there in the best of times. All right. We've got to take another break, but we'll be right back with more of our conversation with the Republican gubernatorial candidate, uh, former Governor Felix Camacho. Stay with us. Across all walks of life, all professions, every societal change, education has been the way forward. As governor, I built four new schools and broke ground on a fifth. 
Tony and I have a plan to modernize and build for the future. This election, vote for the team that has actually done something for education on Guam. For details on our plans for education, visit CamachoAdaForGuam.com. I'm Felix Camacho. I'm Tony Adam. We approve this message. Welcome back. Um, Governor, there doesn't seem to be any, any argument about the need for a new hospital. As right. a matter of fact, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, recommended that uh, the uh, Guam Memorial Hospital be replaced or a new one built. Um, the Governor, Leon Guerrero, has been adamant about uh, building a new hospital. I think the site that she's chosen uh, is in Mangilao. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us uh, about your thoughts regarding uh, our need for a new hospital. Well, I think we need to look at, first of all, the, the, the reality of doing that in a very short uh, time. You've got the current hospital that's crumbling, and um, it is an unsafe environment, not only for the patients, but also for the personnel that are working there. And so you need an, an immediate infusion of cash and an effort to fix what we currently have, while then beginning to plan for the mid and, and long term situation. So the plan would be to repair and, and fix the maternity ward to get that thing up and running uh, as best we can. Um, I know that there have been perhaps some assessments done, as you mentioned. I have not been privy to it. But I believe that we have to fix what we can as best as we can with the current facility we have and then begin to plan with the legislature in, in looking at what are the options we have in financing it you know, they, they're, they're saying it's a minimum of, of a, a million dollars per bed when you're going to design and build a hospital. Uh, what, if, what she's planning right now up, up north would be it's going to require a lot of infrastructure development to bring in the uh, power substation, to bring in the lines that are there, to bring in all, all the utilities that are absolutely necessary to upgrade the road and then to begin to, to plan and build it. Um, so let's face it, that's way down the road. Another thought that, um, that we have would be to approach um, GRMC. And the reason I say this is if, you, is if you look at the current hospital that used to be the Catholic Medical Center. Prior to that, it was the old GMH by what is now the uh, Archbishop Circle. I, I lived right across the street from there as a kid. My mother uh, worked at the hospital as a uh, lab technician. And uh, it was an opportunity for the government to come in and buy out the Catholic Medical Center and establish the current hospital. I believe that there could be opportunities for Guam to perhaps take a look at and negotiate with GRMC and a possible, possible buyout with uh, an extension and a build out of a new maternity ward and taking over a facility like that. And then we, we go to Mangilao and take that facility that's been burned out through an electrical fire, have a structural assessment done. It could be rebuilt and reused go up to the Northern Public Health Center and repair and fix that. We did that, we expanded it. We did the same down, down south in Inarahan. So fix up the central, the north and the south public health centers to bolster and be able to um, service the community at large where there are not emergency situations. Do a short term fix on, on GMH, negotiate a, a potential buyout for GRMC and plan long term for the build out of a, of a new hospital if that's the, the route that our lawmakers and the people of Guam want. But um, we can't simply say that I'm going to park $300 million in my bank, which, will, which would, uh, is what Lou is doing, saying that we're, we're going to build it out there. So if it doesn't happen in five, seven, eight, ten years, that money sits there earning interest for her and her bank. Instead, use that money and, and give it to the people that it was given for. Uh, under the American Rescue, Rescue Plan, but to hold it uh, selfishly there, sitting in a bank when it could serve in, in the repair of the hospital, repair of public health, and, uh, and, and perhaps even negotiate for a p potential buyout. These are the options that I think we all have to explore and take a look at. All right. That's all the time we have for, for this particular segment. We're going to take one more break, and when we come back, we'll be speaking with Lieutenant Governor Candidate Senator Tony Adia. Adda, please stay with us.
so you're registered to vote? Well, what's next? Find your precinct on gec.guam.gov. And if you don't want to wait till election day, remember the early voting center at the Westin Resort begins on Tuesday, October 11th, and they're open from Tuesday through Friday up until Thursday, November 3rd. You can also check out these other satellite voting districts on Saturdays. Ready, set, vote. And we are back, and we'd like to welcome to the show the Republican Lieutenant Governor candidate, Senator Tony Adda. Thanks for joining us, Senator. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, tell us, uh, what would be your role in a Camacho Ada administration? You know, in a Camacho Ada administration, you're going to see both the governor and the lieutenant governor working together for the betterment of our island. And that's where the lieutenant governor is going to come in, and that's where I'm going to come in to ensure that I support the governor in every way possible to ensure that he's able to lead the island, and anywhere that I can be placed, that I will be there. Yes. The governor has enumerated... Uh, bunch of different things that he'd like to uh, address during your administration should you guys be elected. Mm -hmm. What would you see as the top priorities? Well, the top priorities at this point in time, as we speak, is, is public safety. We really need to do what we can to get more officers on the street and how can we entice people to become police officers. They need, we need to start getting people to apply to become officers so that we'll be able to move people up the ladder, get new folks into, into the department start training them and get them out. Do you see value in establishing a relationship uh, with the legislature? And um, is your experience as a legislator uh, an asset uh, should you guys win in, in the uh, November election? Well, you can assure that we will have a relationship with the legislature. You know, I, I felt what it's, what it's like not to have a relationship with the administration these past several years. And, you know, it's important because the, the legislature is the, the, the purse strings. They're the ones that get the budget together and give us what uh, appropriation that they'll be able to do. But we can't do it uh, physically if we're not working together. You know, we can't always ask for what we don't have. And the legislature also has to come to the table and says, this is what we have, so this is what we'll be able to give. And it's a give and take between both branches, two co-equal branches of government, you know. There's three co-equal branches of government, but with, between the legislature and the administration, and also the judiciary, we need to work together. And, and finally, uh, why did you want to be lieutenant governor? What was your reaction when you were approached and asked uh, to be uh, Governor Camacho's running mate? You know, whenever um, you have an opportunity for public service, whether it be in the military or um, in public service and running for a senator or any, any office. Anytime you have an opportunity to try to make the lives of our people better, our island greater, then you know you should always take that opportunity and step up to the plate. Uh, the outcome is not always what you want it to be, but at least you can say, you know, I, I tried my best and this is my, my best foot forward and I'm going to go with it. When Governor Camacho approached me to ask me to be his running mate, and at first, uh, you know, naturally I have to, you know, ask the wife, right? I check with the family. But I didn't hesitate. It, it was a, an answer that I gave him that said, sure, you know, we can work together to ensure that the betterment of our island is always the first and foremost top priority. All right. Republican Lieutenant Governor Candidate Senator Tony Anna, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Nestor. We'll be right back. Just like you, Felix and I are outraged at the growing crime rate and lack of justice on Guam. We are outraged at the number of criminals arrested, released, and back on the streets committing more crimes. Along with crime prevention and reduction initiatives, Felix and I will work with lawmakers, law enforcement, and the courts to reduce repeat offenders. Prevention, rehabilitation where possible, and harsh punishments for criminals. It's time for a new season. I'm Felix Camacho. I'm Tony Adam. We, we approve, approve this message. And there you have it, our interview with the two teams running for Adloop. We want to thank them for their time and for sharing their thoughts and ideas for governing our island in the next four years. 
We hope you feel a little better informed now and we'll help you with your decision come election day. I'm Nestor Lecanto. Thanks for watching and please remember to vote.